Hey, good morning, GC. Who's happy to be in the building today? You guys ready to worship Jesus? Come on, we're gonna put our hands together just like this. That looks good. Come on, we're gonna sing this out together. We're gonna sing to, to Jesus this morning about the joy that he's given us. Got joy in the struggle. Got peace in the storm. Strength in the battle. I don't fear anymore. a new song this morning to share with you. Let's join together. Get our hands together. Let's go. Come on, get your hands up, hands up, people of heaven. Sing it hallelujah to ya for all we've been into our children of the King. Every promise kept only hope I lived on and sing. Come on. We gotta live, live forever. We gotta live, live forever. Come on, get 
You may have walked in this morning and everything has fallen apart. But our God wants you to know that He is there to make you whole, that He is faithful when we are faithless, that He gives us everything when we have nothing. He gave us His life, He gives us His love this morning. We seek this for that reason, and we acknowledge Him today. I call you faithful for the promises you've kept.
steps out in faith knowing he is opening those doors this morning, Generation Church. Let's sing this out for every morning. has been so good to us. Amen. You go ahead and take a seat right now. This is a moment in our service where we share in communion together each month and remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. So as you walked in today, you should have received the elements. And if you didn't, you just go ahead and lift your hands and our ushers will make sure that you get some right now. But you know, as I was thinking through this moment this week, I was thinking, have you ever mismanaged your priorities in your life? I know I have. You know, my, my wife and I, we got married on May 23rd of 2009, and there's a time where you put that on the calendar and you're like, hey, it's gonna be the day that I get to marry my best friend right there. She's so pretty. Amen for all the guys that married up, right? <laughs> but when that day got here, May 23rd, I realized something, and that was that every single year my anniversary would be happening right about the same time as the NBA Finals. And I'm also a big basketball fan. So we're in Hawaii for our honeymoon. I'm sitting across from the dinner table at these restaurants with my beautiful new bride making sure we're at places with TVs where I could face that TV and be halfway in and halfway. How many people know that my priorities were mismanaged, amen? Sometimes we do that. All the ladies said amen on that one. <laughs> but the same is true with God's ways. You know, if we want our life to resemble what God has for us, what I have found is this, is that your priorities dictate your lifestyle. Your priorities dictate your lifestyle. If you want your lifestyle to be God's ways, then your priorities need to be the things of God. I have a friend who says it this way, if prayer is your priority, then miracles are gonna be your lifestyle. Whatever you make your priority will become the lifestyle that you walk in. And that's why communion is so important. There's so many distractions in our life and this is a moment where we could come together and say, you know what, I'm making God the priority. Nothing else matters in this moment. I'm gonna remember the sacrifice that Jesus made because I want his ways to be my lifestyle. 
Jesus says to do this and to do it often, to keep him in the forefront of our mind, to remember the sacrifice that he made. So right now, if you would, just take the bread. This bread represents the body that was broken, the body that was beaten and bruised for you and I. Jesus took on all of that because he loves us that much. So today, let's go ahead and take the bread together. Remember him. The Bible says that likewise, he took the cup, represents the blood that was poured out on that cross. Regardless of the sin that we have in our life, he offers forgiveness for us. He offers wholeness for us. The blood that cleanses us, that makes us whole. Can you remember that sacrifice that Jesus made for us? Let's take the cup. Will you pray with me today? God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for us. You gave your one and only son, not because we deserved it, but because you wanted us to be in a relationship with you. You wanted to bridge the gap, the separation that we had. There's no greater love, God, than the fact that you have given your son for us. And today we make you the priority with all the other distractions in our life, God, those things don't matter in this moment. Right now, all that matters is you and our eyes are on you. God, thank you for your sacrifice. It's in your name we pray, amen. You go ahead and pass your elements to the aisles and our ushers will get it for you. But can we stand together, church, one last time? Let's continue to worship because there's a power in the name of Jesus. And so regardless of what you're walking through today, let's make Jesus our priority. If you're comfortable, can we close your eyes? Can we lift our hands? Let's give God your situation. Let's give him our life. And let's speak the name of Jesus today. I just wanna speak the name of Jesus.
And God, we know that there is power in that name of your son, Jesus. God, right now we give you our life. We give you our situations. We give you this service today. As we step out of here later on today, God, change us, transform us, transform our minds so we could be a light for you. We want to walk out different than we walked in today. Amen. Today is going to be an amazing day. Church, can someone say amen and get loud for Jesus? Come on now. Listen, you can go ahead and take... Let's see, today's going to be a great day here at Generation Church. I'm Mike Stevens. I'm one of the pastors here at GC. And on behalf of our lead pastors, Pastors Ben and Melissa Pierce, we are so honored that you chose to come and worship with us today. Today's going to be a great day here. Listen, if it's your first time with us, you are our VIP church. Can we get loud for all the first time guests today? Come on. We're so happy you're here. Listen, if it is your first time with us in the seat back in front of you, there's a connection card that looks just like this. We would be honored if you would just fill that out and you can take it to our VIP station later on uh, today and get a free gift. They have a spin wheel with all these gifts and you just have some fun with that. But you can also use the QR code that's going on the screen as well and do the connection card digitally right there. And then on the back side of that connection card is actually a prayer card. And so if you're walking through anything, our prayer team would love to partner with you and seek God with you. And so you can use that prayer card and take it to our prayer stations in the back later on today as well. But listen, today is going to be a great day here at God's house. It's a good season here at Generation Church. Today, you'll notice in the lobby, we have group signups. How many people love some GC groups? Let me hear you. Listen, that's where life happens. It's where you connect with people. We believe that, that doing life in circles and not in rows is so important for your life and your spiritual growth. And so make sure you get into a group. We got freedom groups, we got grief share, we got celebrate recovery. There's men's, women's, and uh, married couples. So many different groups. Make sure you go out there, ask questions, and sign up for some groups. They all begin in just a couple weeks, but the menu is live and online as well. You can go to generationchurch.com slash group. Someone say slash groups. Now you're going to remember it. So go on there and find a group that fits your life and your schedule. And then also ladies in the house, are you ready for devoted? 
It's going to be good. August the 31st, 7 o'clock right here. It's a Thursday night. You don't want to miss it. They are all ready for an amazing night here at GC at Devoted. Make sure you sign up for it, though. You need to register at generationchurch.com slash events, or you can do it on our app as well. But ladies, make sure you sign up for that because it's going to be an amazing time here at GC that Thursday night. But church, listen, I just want to thank you for partnering with us. I want to thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness to seeing the hands and feet of Jesus go out into our community. When we partner together, there's amazing things we could do, and we could be the light of Christ in the world around us. And here at GC, there's a few ways you could partner with us, and all those ways are on the screen. You could give physically using those envelopes that are in the seat back in front of you. Just place your gift in there and use our safe receptacles on your way out later on today. But you also give like many people do, and that's digitally through text to give online or through the app. And again, all those instructions are on the screen. But we're just so honored that you, so many of you partner with us to make a difference. You know, there's, uh, God uh, says in his word for us to give a tithe and to be generous people and to make a difference in the world around us. And in, in James 1.22, you see that it says to not just hear the word and so deceive yourself, but to do what it says. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church where so many of us step in together in unity and do what the word of God says. And you can see the difference it's making in Jupiter and all the surrounding areas. So thank you, church, for partnering with us here at GC. Can we go ahead and bless our offering today? God, we love you so much, and I thank you for what you're doing in and through us here at Generation Church to make a difference for your kingdom. God, it's all about you. God, we just want to point people to you and the hope that you bring to our life, God, that we can live in relationship with you. God, I pray that today you bless the gift and the giver the way your word says that you're going to. God, we love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. What's up, Generation Church? How we doing today? So good to see everybody, to our church family online. So glad you guys have tuned in, to everybody here live in the service. So glad you guys are here. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Ben Pierce, and I look forward just to getting to know you. Uh, if you haven't been to Next Steps yet, go to Next Steps. It'll help you get connected to, uh, to the church family, and there's so many amazing things that are happening. One of the things that is happening that I want to tell you about is we are finally going to build the East Parking Lot after... Uh, getting that walked through the local uh, governments and, and uh, planning and zoning, we finally have our approvals. And so now we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with about 85 cars uh, over the month of September. So uh, be on the lookout. We'll have uh, maps and directions and shuttles and, and all of that for you. So uh, September, no, I'm sorry, August 28th is the day that we're going to start construction on that. So uh, just be on the lookout and, um, and please keep coming. All right. We'll park you. Just keep coming. Um, and those of you guys watching online, keep tuning in as well, too. And then for the 10 o'clock service, thank you guys for helping. Uh, you know, we've been putting out an SOS over the past few weeks, which is a scoot over some uh, request to make room for, for people that are trying to come in. And so if you have space in between you, try to scoot over. You know, I don't care if you put like a seat in between you and, and someone else, but if there's big gaps, try to fill those in so we can make room for new people. And our donut wall launched in the 830 service. So some of you, I think, came to two services just to get the donuts, but we're really trying to bribe you to come out of the 10 o'clock service and go to the 8.30 uh, or the 11, uh, because this is a primetime service. This is where people who are unchurched will just naturally show up looking for God. And so if you, uh, if you could go to one of those other services and make room for uh, seekers, that would be amazing. Okay, so we are in the middle or the beginning of a new series called Beyond Belief, and this series is uh, really just designed to, to help stretch your faith, to grow your faith, and we want to deal with some things that are, are maybe even just beyond the idea of your faith. I want to get into some areas and discussion around things like doubt, which we'll talk about today, um, maybe some deconstruction, what happens when you feel abandoned by God or abandoned by people, so we've got a lot of topics that we're going to talk about. And then uh, we're going to do a series. The second part of the book of Daniel is going to launch in August, and that's titled Angels, Aliens, and Armageddon. Come on, somebody. 
Don't you just want to come to that series? Angels, Aliens, and Armageddon? Yes. So anyhow, um, all right, well, let's get into today. I want to talk to you today under this title, Dealing with Doubt. Those of you watching online, just type that in the chat right there, Dealing with Doubt. You know, all of us have a faith belief uh, structure of, of what we believe about life, but in, in the middle of all of those beliefs, we, we have some doubts. And, uh, and I think those doubts are important things for us to confront and explore and look at in order to strengthen our faith. And so, uh, you know, um, over the past few weeks, I've had my own journey in this, if, if you will. And, uh, you know, I've been back and forth to the doctor for this crazy water that I have stuck in my ear that I can't get out. Had it in there for about six weeks. And I, I can't tell if it's from PK4-23 that I talked about a few weeks ago, the coronavirus uh, that came out of Jupiter Christian School um, through my son and gave to me and tried to kill me with it. Um, I can't tell if it's something that I picked up from there or if it's all the wakeboarding I did in Maine on vacation, but I have water jammed in my ear and I can't hear out of this side. And, um, and so I've been asking the Lord, like, Lord, would you heal me of this? Because you know I'm a preacher, like I can't hear this half of the room and I can't hear myself and I can't hear the Holy Ghost because he only speaks in my left ear. And, um, and you know, it's easy to, to, to pray for somebody else's healing and believe God, but sometimes it's, it's hard to pray for your own healing and believe God for your own healing. And, and I got to be honest, like after six weeks of this, I'm like, God, where are you? And you may think as a pastor, like I don't have the same doubts that you deal with, but I do. I put my pants on one leg at a time and, and, and we all deal with doubts. And, and last night, um, you know, I, um, I was trying to get ready for today and Saturdays at our house are, are sacred times. Like, we really don't do anything on Saturday nights. We just chill, hang around the house. We go to bed early. I get up at 5 a.m. every Sunday morning just to spend time with the Lord and refine the message and, and all of that. And, and so uh, last night I laid down, and Melissa gave me two horse pills of magnesium. I asked where she got it from, and she said, Pet Supply Plus. <laughs> all right, if it helps me sleep, it helps me sleep. And... Um, so I took these pills, I lay down, and about an hour into going to sleep, Ethan, our, our one-and-a-half-year-old, he wakes up like scream crying. Anybody's one-and-a-half-year-old, like, like, it's not crying, it's like, I, I'm angry at the world, and nothing will solve this. And so, you know, we go up there, and we, we love on him, and hold him, and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm awake. And he just won't stop, y'all. And I'm like, it is Saturday night, and I told him, I have to be awake in four hours, I got to preach tomorrow. Like, please, to God, do something with the child. And um, I, I was laying there in the bed last night, and I felt myself turning green. I was like the Hulk. I'm like, I'm watching way too many Avengers movies. I literally wanted to take the, the monitor and yank it out of the wall and throw it across the room. And I slammed the door. This is not me. I don't do this kind of stuff. And then as I'm laying there, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I want to, I want to like kick the glass out of the slider right now. Like, I, I am so angry. And then I remembered that in my, my watery ear journey, my doctor prescribed prednisone for me. So I'm on steroids, in case you're wondering. And, and, and the side effects are anger and frustration and insomnia. And so I laid there last night, and I rewrote the entire message, by the way, for this morning. The last time I looked at the clock was 3.55 a.m., and I got up at 5 so I've got about an hour and five minutes of sleep in me. So if I don't preach the next service, it's because I said something stupid in this one, and Melissa will be covering the next one. Um, but I said all that to say this, because I think sometimes in our lives, we, we look at people who stand on a platform or are a pastor or a leader, and we think they, they don't deal with the same things I deal with. And, and doubt is one of the things that that there is a stigma around for most of us as believers that we don't want to acknowledge. Like, you, you can't just walk up to your friends and say, dude, I'm really just doubting. I'm, I'm doubting my faith. I'm doubting my salvation. I'm doubting that God loves me. I'm doubting that God's good. I'm doubting that all of this crap in the world is going on because there's a good God in heaven who's ignoring. I don't, I, I, I'm doubting all of these things. And, and my, you can't just walk up to your, your friends at small group and tell them that. 
because you feel disqualified as a Christian. You feel disqualified, as, but the reality is we all deal with it, me included. I have my own doubts. I have my own moments when I'm taking steroids. And I think it's important for us to take the stigma away, at least for today. And let's dig into how do we deal with our doubts. Because every single one of us have them. The Bible tells us in Matthew 28 that after Jesus had risen from the dead and he meets his disciples, it says this in verse 16, that the 11 disciples left from Galilee and they were going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. In verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. What? How in the world can the 11 disciples who were with Jesus, the 12th one is gone, Judas hung himself, but how can the rest of them have seen Jesus when the dove descended in the form of the Holy Spirit and, and God spoke to him from heaven, this is my son and whom I'm well pleased, affirmed him as the Messiah when John the Baptist said, make way for the lamb who is slain, who is the savior of the world. And they saw Jairus' daughter raised from the dead and they saw lame people walk and blind eyes open and Lazarus came forth and they watched Jesus get arrested and crucified and the tomb was filled with his body, the stone was sealed, and then three days later he was gone, and then he shows up on a mountain and he preaches and they worship. And the Bible says that some of them still doubted. How could they have gone through every single bit of that and seen everything that they had seen Jesus do and accomplish and still have doubt? I think it helps us to locate ourselves a little bit when it relates to how we have doubts in our own life. And I think it kind of lets the pressure off a little bit. Like th these were Jesus' chosen um, 12. They, they were his, his pupils. These are the people that were going to build the, the church. And they saw all of these miracles, but yet they still doubted. And so sometimes we find ourselves in a place where you may be doubting your salvation. You, you find yourself sometimes where you may be doubting God's love for you. We may be doubting God's promises for you. We may have even doubt the reliability of Scripture, the existence of God. We might even have doubts around the identity of who Christ is. But you're in good company. Because most of the people who were faith patriarchs in Hebrews chapter 11, they doubted. They are who they are because their doubt developed their faith. And your doubt is not something to be scared of. It's not something to run away from. It is something to confront. And it is something to, to allow God to help you work through so that your faith on the other side of doubt is strengthened. I mean, even John the Baptist, who, who Jesus said this about in Matthew eleven eleven, he says, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, no one is greater than John the Baptist. What Jesus said about him, his own cousin, whose purpose for being on planet earth was to make way the path of the Messiah. But yet in Matthew 11, he doubted. And he asked this question. He said, Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? If the 11 doubted, John the Baptist doubted then we all know that you doubt. We doubt. It's part of life. But, but here's the thing about doubt. It is something that we need to normalize in our faith walk, but it is not something that we need to ignore. Because even though we all doubt and we all struggle with it and we all have momentary lapses of faith, you can't let those doubts continue to live unaddressed because they will fester and those doubts will, will go from a place of doubt to denial and ultimately, if you're not careful, to deconstruction or even derailment of your faith. And so I have five things for you today that I, I want to help you with that are, are practical. If you want to take some notes, I think it would be helpful to write these down. You can get it on the app at the app store at Gen Church FL. Those of you watching online, they'll be there for you as well. Here's the first thing as we start to deal with our doubt that I think is important. We need to understand this, that God is not disillusioned by your doubts. He's not afraid of them. God is not scared of your doubts. God does not look at you and he's like, Brad, 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 Brad. 
what the heck, dude? He, he is not looking at you like, what, what was wrong with you? He's, he's not afraid of them. He's not disillusioned by them. As a matter of fact, God's heart towards us when we are in doubt is that of mercy. In Jude chapter 1, verse 22, he, he tells us, he says, have mercy on those who doubt. In the Bible, it tells us in, in Hebrews that we can come th- boldly to the throne of grace and we can obtain mercy in a time of need. So God is not disillusioned by your doubts. And if God is not disillusioned by your doubts, then you shouldn't be disillusioned by them either. And you shouldn't act like they don't exist. And you shouldn't hang on to them and, and harbor them. You should talk through them. You should find trusted people and mentors and believers and small group leaders and friends at church. And you should talk through those things because the reality is if you're feeling it, somebody else probably has as well. And there's help there. There's, there's mercy there. He's not disillusioned by our doubts. And the best of us have fallen prey to doubt. In, in the book of Matthew chapter 14, this is a story of, of Peter as he walks on the water. Now, they had just come through a huge ministry season, and Jesus had just fed the 5,000, and he puts the boys in a boat, and he sends them across, and he comes out walking on the water at night. And Peter sees him off in the distance. He's like, who is that? What is that? He says, Jesus, is that you? That's where we pick up the story. And Peter replied to him, Tell me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, Jesus responds back, come. And he said, Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out to the Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And then Jesus makes the statement. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And I think when we read that passage sometimes, that, that, that phrase feels so accusatory. You of little faith, why did you doubt? But it's not an accusatory statement. Jesus is not trying to accuse Peter of having faith. As a matter of fact, Peter's the only one who got out of the stinking boat. Let's just give him a round of applause. Come on, somebody. When's the last time you stepped in a tub and didn't get your toes wet? He's the only one. But Jesus wasn't trying to to discredit his failure. He was trying to to walk him through his doubt to get him to the next level. And so he's asking him a question, not to make him feel bad, but to help him start the process of dealing with his doubt. How how do I know that? Well, I can tell just from the, the passage of Scripture, there's a couple things that are important to pick out. When did Peter's doubt start to happen? when he got his eyes off Jesus and he started watching the wind and the waves. He's walking on the water. Are you freaking kidding me? He's walking on the water and he's watching Jesus. And then he, out of the corner of his eye, sees a wave. and He's like, oh, that's a big one. And all of a sudden his faith begins to falter and doubt begins to seep in. And and the more he takes his eyes off of Jesus, the, the further he gets to sinking in the water. But Jesus is not messed up by it, and he's not disillusioned by yours because this is what Jesus does. Peter, he yells out, Lord, save me. And what did Jesus do? He reaches his hand down and he rescues him in the middle of his doubt. And wherever you are today, whatever doubts you've had, whatever things have disillusioned you, whatever uh, information has come into your life that has caused you to question parts and pieces and certain aspects of God or the kingdom. God is not messed up by that. As a matter of fact, God is excited about it because those doubts are the groundwork for a a faith that is getting ready to flourish. Because on the other side of that doubt, see, Peter went from doubt to denial to derailment to building the church. 
I mean, Peter, in, in verse chapter 14, he's, he's walking on water. He's failing in his faith. He's sinking to chapter 16 just a, about two weeks later. And Jesus is asking him, who do people say that I am? And out of all of the disciples and everybody else, Peter went from a place of doubt to now a place of confidence. And he says, well, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus stands back and he's like, what the heck? He's like, this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, Peter. This is revealed to you by my father. Jesus' hand to pick him up was part of a catalyst that helped him to move forward and to grow in his faith. So I firmly believe this, that doubt is the gap between your current faith and perfect faith. Your place of doubt is the gap between where your faith is right now and where your faith is in a mature state. And if you can navigate doubt from where you are now, you'll begin to walk the path to a full and mature faith. Hebrews 12 and 1 tells us, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and weight that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith meaning that Jesus, the word, is the author. The the faith that we have is based on the scriptures. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. He's the author and finisher. He is the writer and perfecter. He is the one who gave the promises in the first place, and he's the one who walks you through the promises past the place of doubt into the place of mature and perfect faith. He authors it, and he perfects it. And then Hebrews 6.19 goes on and it tells us this, that that this hope that we have is an anchor in our soul. So your doubts don't derail God. Your doubts, they don't disillusion him. He actually sees them as an opportunity for your personal growth. And I think it's important for us to get the stigma off of of our doubts and our, our failures in our faith. And it's important for us to stand up and say, hey, you know what? This is real life. The best of us have had doubts. Now, God, would you help me work through those doubts? And would you strengthen my faith? And I believe this, point number two, that doubt is a catalyst to a deeper faith. Doubt is is part of that that catalyzing agent of change that causes you to to get to a place of, of deeper trust and faith in God. And if you ignore your doubts and you just let them fester under the surface, then you will never get to the place of a deeper, mature faith. You gotta go through some struggle to understand that there is a savior. You've gotta go through some mess to understand that he has a message for you. You gotta make yourself push through some of these problems in life because on the other side of that pain is God's purpose for you. So we can't just allow the, the doubts of this life in this world to just lay there undealt with. In James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, that's doubt, produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, if you never had moments of doubt, there would be no place for the doubt-crushing, miracle-working power of God. It is in the place of our doubts where God shows up and shows off. It is in the place of our doubts where things aren't working the way that we want them to work, and we give God space, and we reach out and trust, and, and he reaches his hand down in our doubts, and when our fingers touch his fingers, miracles begin to happen, and that is where your faith is strengthened because you see the promises of God come to pass in everyday life. But if you never reach your hand out to him and say, help me, God, and you never have the opportunity to see his power displayed and at work. See, Peter working through his doubt on the water led to this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, just a few short weeks later. And if he had never worked through that doubt, he would never have had that revelation. The third thing is this, that we have to get to the place in our life where we begin to doubt our doubts more than we doubt our beliefs. Man, it's so easy to doubt our beliefs. 
Like we believe these things, we've seen it, we've heard it, the, the scriptures talk about it. I mean, these guys watch Jesus do it, perform the miracle, but how in the world could they watch all of that happen and still believe their doubts over their beliefs? But this is part of the human condition, that, that we, we have this place inside of us that, that, that we want to believe the conspiracy theory. We want to believe the crazy stuff. We, we want to believe the things that we have no actual real data for. We want to believe the things that there's no real proof for and the things that are solidly there and proven that have been tested and tried for thousands of years and have been displayed in our own hearts. We've seen the miracle working power of God over and over and over again. How can we walk through all of that and still come to a place of doubt? It's because it's easier to believe in the unknown. I don't know why we're wired that way. Maybe it's part of the fall. Maybe it's because the device of the devil is doubt. I mean, the very first device that he used to deceive Adam and Eve was doubt. But we've got to get to the place where we begin to doubt our doubts more than we doubt our beliefs. Because the reality is our doubts are, are just poking holes in something that, that has been tried and true and confirmed by the witness of the Holy Spirit. We've seen it happen. I mean, just think back to your conversion experience. When you end, end up in a doubtful situation, just think back to the, the weeks after you gave your life to Christ. I mean, if you've had a real conversion experience, you don't just have a religion, you've had a real conversion experience, those few weeks after you gave your life to Christ were electric. Like there was something happening in you that you can't explain, a joy, a peace a connection, a relationship with God, that that's the anchor of our soul that the writer of Hebrews was trying to help us get to. And so if we can begin to doubt our doubts more than we doubt our beliefs, we begin to, to deconstruct the doubt. Chuck Smith, who's the founder of Calvary Chapel Church around the, the world, he said, never trade what you don't know for what you do know. Never trade what you don't know for what you do know. And that's what our doubts are. Our doubts are trading what we don't know for something that we do. That God has already given us and spoken to us and promised us. And Peter saw the miracles of Jesus. He saw the water turn to wine. He saw the paralyzed walk, the dead raised, the woman with the issue of blood healed, the 5,000. He, he saw, but yet he believed his doubts more than all of the evidence that he had that Jesus was the Messiah. If we can learn to doubt our doubts, that's a huge step forward. See, doubt is this device of the devil. And I think this is an important thing for us to chew on because doubts are not some infusion of new information that changes your existing belief structure. That's not what a doubt is. A doubt is not new, solid information that changes you. A doubt is something that is full of holes, meant to poke holes, that tries to portray itself as truth, but it's actually a spiritual weapon. And I think we have to see doubt is that when you feel that as a follower of God, when you begin to have those feelings or those senses, it is not something trying to lead you to truth. It is not something trying to, to help you understand the world or the kingdom or, or God better. It is a device of the devil. It is the very same device that caused the fall of humanity. And why would you believe the father of lies who has never had the truth in him from the beginning? And why would you believe something that he brings to you to set up as some new truth? We gotta learn to doubt the doubts and doubt the father of lies. In Genesis 3, the scripture tells us that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And Satan entered into this serpent. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? This is doubt. And doubt begins to poke holes at what you know to be true. Now, Adam and Eve had already had a conversation with God. They knew what trees they could eat from and what tree they could not eat from. They knew what God had said about the whole situation. It was completely clear. There was no deception in their understanding. But he comes and he starts asking questions. Did God really say he would heal you? 
God really say that the blood of Jesus washes you clean? Did God really say that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Did God really say that you can have peace? Did God really say that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world? Did God really say that you can have the victory over anxiety? Did God really say these things about you? He begins to ask questions. That's what he asked Eve. Did God really say that? Verse two, of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Already, the questioning has created false information. God never said, don't touch it. He said, don't eat it. And she's already beginning to get it all twisted. It's, it's getting mixed up in her mind. Wait, what did God really say? I don't know. He said, don't touch it. Don't eat it. Don't look at it. Don't sniff it. What did God say? And this is the tactic of the enemy to, to, to begin to poke holes in what God said. And before you know it, if you're not super in tune with what the promises of God for you are, you'll begin to twist them. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. The lion will lay with the lamb. Not in the Bible. I just broke some of y'all right there. Not in the Bible. He begins to twist truth in order to infuse doubt. Then verse 4, he says, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And so what did Satan do? He sowed doubt. God hasn't said it. Now they begin to question God. And this is what the devil does in our lives. He begins to poke holes and sow doubt. And, and what the word of God says about us, and, and all of a sudden our lives begin to be split between dual loyalties, loyalty to the kingdom of God and loyalty to the kingdom of this world. And so we begin to, to have doubt, and, and, and here's the thing about doubt that he sows, this tactic of the enemy. He never shows you the other side of the coin. He only shows you the tempting part of it. He shows he asks questions. Does sex before marriage really matter? Does drinking really bite you like a snake in the end? Does watching all this online content really drive you away from intimacy with God? See, doubt never showed Eve that that fruit that she ate was going to bring down the fall and failure of humanity. That doubt never showed her that Cain was going to rise up with a stone and bludgeon his brother to death as a result of Adam and Eve's doubt. That doubt never showed her what was going to happen, that there would be billions of people over thousands of years that would struggle, that would come into this world, that would fall away, and they would end up in an eternity of hell because of a decision that they made. The devil never showed her that. All he did was say, it looks good for food. It'll make you wise. It'll make you like God. And he starts showing her just the tempting side of the coin, but not the truth side of the coin. He never shows you the pieces of your soul that you split up when you've had multiple intimate relationships and now you're struggling in your marriage because your heart is given to 50 other people along the, the way. He never shows you the liver disease or the alcoholism or the early death because you started having a few too many. None of the beer commercials show you throwing up in the throne room the next morning. It's always like, yeah, party, white claw, you know, whatever. You can't say Bud Light anymore because, they, you know, you choose a new alcoholic beverage. They don't show you the throne room images. They show you the temptation and the doubt that it sows into your life. So how do we combat that? The fourth thing I want you to write down is this, that you have to draw closer to God in your doubts. And when you do that, he will draw closer to you. The stigma is I feel bad about drawing closer to God in my doubts. I feel guilty. I feel unworthy. 
I feel like I shouldn't be having this conversation. And the tendency is when we start to have doubts, we start studying the other side of the coin and we start trying to uncover the unknown and we begin to give up what is known and what is trusted and what is true and what the world is built on and what the kingdom is built on. We walk away from the promises of God to begin to search out and study some rabbit trail of false truth that has sown a seed of doubt. And, and if you would just take the time to say, you know what? I'm not going to abandon what I know to be true. I'm actually going to push into what I know to be true. I'm going to strengthen what I know to be true. I'm going to strengthen my prayer time. I'm going to strengthen my study time. I'm actually going to jump in and I'm going to start studying the scripture where other people doubted it. How did they deal with it? And what did God do in their life? See, when we push into intimacy with God, he responds to that. When Peter jumped out of the boat and began to sink and he pushed into intimacy with God and he he got past the, the, um, the, the stigma of his doubt and he said, Lord, help me. That's when Jesus reached his hand out and lifted him up. And we probably know the scripture. It's very familiar. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double minded. The problem is we think that our doubts disqualify us and somehow that we distance ourselves from God in our doubts instead of pushing closer to him. The fifth and final point for today is, is this, that we destroy doubt by meditating on God's word. If you want to learn to deal with your doubts, you destroy doubt by meditating on his word. You've got to push into an intimate relationship with him. Don't let your doubts distance you. But then you've got to get in there and meditate on his word. Romans 10, 17 says this, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith happens when you hear what God's word says about you and about your situation. Now, in the original language, we don't see this in, in English, but in the original Greek language, there are two words for the word word. The first one is logos. It means written word. That's not what this word is. The second word for word in the Greek language is rhema. And rhema means a revealed word, where it goes from being on the page to alive in your heart. And what Romans 10, 17 tells us is that when you're dealing with doubt and you begin to meditate on God's word, it goes from the place of being a written word that you read on pages to then a revealed word that exists on the inside of you. So faith comes by hearing the written word and hearing the word of God produces revelation. And when you have revelation, nobody can take that away from you. When God has revealed his truth to you, his promise to you, there is no amount of doubt that can erode that. So we deal with doubt. We destroy doubt by meditating on his word. We have to meditate on it until it becomes a revelation to us. So faith squashes doubt when God's word goes from just these words on a page to revelation in our And the last thing that I felt like God gave me for today as an assignment for you at about 3 o'clock this morning was this, this point. This is not point number six. This is like an extra credit point. When we say the phrase that God sent his only son to die on the cross for us so that you could have abundant life, I think in some ways in in the Christian world, we have said that so much that it has lost its weight and its value to us. We say it every weekend in altar calls, you hear it all around church, but, but I think we've lost what it really means. And, and I think there's a generation of us who have doubts in us because we are asking God for things that his hand can give us instead of understanding what his heart has for us. And when we are, are seeking God for what his hand can do for us, and it doesn't happen when and how and where in the way that we want it to, then all of a sudden it, it opens the door for doubt. But, but I just I want to challenge you with this thought because 
if God never did anything for you but save you, it's enough. If he never healed you from a disease, if he never blessed you financially, if he never brought you a spouse, if he never gave you anything else except your salvation, it is enough. You want to deal with doubt? Understand that what you have is enough because this life is a vapor. Your next breath is not even promised to you. It could be here one second and gone the next. And the only thing that really matters is where you wake up on the other side of your last breath. And he is enough. He's just enough. His salvation for us is enough. And if we can get back to that foundation, Christ is enough. And it closes the door to doubt. The next time that doubt creeps in, remind yourself that God is enough. That his salvation and his sacrifice is enough. Peter, the, the same man that doubted and denied and disconnected, would, would write this about our faith as he faced his own crucifixion. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I, I want you to read this, verses 5 through 21. Go home and read it today. I don't have time to read it in the service. But but Peter, who faced it, who faced doubt, and he denied Jesus, and and he completely disconnected. He went fishing. He was done with the the church, the ministry. He He was gone. And Jesus came and restored him. At the end of his life, having allowed doubt to be the catalyst of a deeper faith, He writes this entire scripture in 2 Peter 1. And I'll just give you a couple of excerpts. He says this, supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and with knowledge and self-control and patience and endurance with godliness and with brotherly affection and with love for everyone. He says this, verse eight, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's encouraging the doubter is encouraging you to add to your faith. He's encouraging you to deepen your faith. He's encouraging you to to confront your doubts. He's encouraging you to share them and deal with them and expose them and shine the light on them. And he's encouraging you to, to, to ask Jesus to stretch out his hand when you're drowning in disbelief. And I think by the time he was facing his own crucifixion upside down. He had figured out a few things around doubt. He'd figured out a few strategies or skills to defeat the device of doubt. He said, verse 16, for these, we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. And when he received honor and glory from God the Father, we saw it. The voice from majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven. And when we were with him on that holy mountain, and because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. And he says, you must pay close attention to what they wrote for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And Christ, the morning star shines in your heart. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke from God meaning that that can be trusted. The word, we're off key over there, guys. The word can be trusted. And the word will eliminate your doubts. That's the foundation that we build our lives on. So here's what I want to do as we get ready to close this service. I want to give you an opportunity to maybe deal with your doubts. Maybe you're here today and you've never given God a place in your heart. You've had doubts 
around this whole Christianity thing. God's tugging on your heart today. He's giving you an opportunity to confront those doubts. And I just want to lead you in a prayer. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes with me? Pray this prayer with me. Say this with me. Mean it with your whole heart. Say, Father God, I want to know you more intimately. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. And make me a new person today. God, I give you my life. I dedicate my life to you. Strengthen my faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. And with your eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer, we want to take this last minute of the service. We just want to celebrate it because it is the most important moment of your life. So in a second, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, with every eye closed, I just want you to slip your hand up. Just wave at me. We're going to give you a big round of applause. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Go ahead and lift your hands up all across the room. Come on, Generation Church. Let's encourage those that are giving their lives to Jesus today. So proud of you. As we get ready to close out the service, we've got some folks that are part of the team. They've got a free gift for you to help you take some next growth steps. It's in an orange bag. Please don't leave until they get a chance to connect with each of you. If we miss you, they are also in the back prayer areas. If you need prayer, please go back, avail yourselves. We'd love to pray for you for anything that you have need of. And those of you watching online, click the link. We'll send you the same free gift as well. Hey, we love you guys so much. We can stand to our feet as we're getting ready to be dismissed. Next week, we'll pick up with part two on how to wait on God in our series, Beyond Belief. Until we get to see you next week, go out and inspire somebody to follow Jesus. Generation Church. We can't wait to hear how God continues to move in your life. Be sure to join us back next week at 10 or 1130 right here on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you then. That's the foundation that we build our lives on. So here's what I want to do as we get ready to close this service.